Hello and welcome back. This video is going to review how to teach using a video curriculum. And it will feature Dr. Alyssa Majesco with our Critical Care Division and Dr. Girish Galra who are both using video curricular to teach. Dr. Kalra, why did you decide to do an EKG curriculum? Uh, so I've been teaching students on the clerkship at EKG since 2011. Um, and in 2011, our EKG curriculum you know, really had two kind of uh, cornerstones, um, which is practice and being systematic. And uh, so we had two class sessions kind of built around these two uh, kind of hallmarks of learning EKGs. And really, we tried to spend our class time practicing. And so this uh, curriculum worked great for a couple of years. We got a lot of great feedback. Um, however, kind of as time went on, I was noticing that in class, uh, we were spending less time practicing and we were kind of spending more time reviewing basics. Um, and so in class, what I was finding is I'd get questions like, what's a T-wave inversion? Um, so in 2013, uh, we really sat down and we thought about how we could uh, kind of teach students these basics um, and spend more of our class time practicing. Um, and so I sat down with the clerkship director, Richard Pittman, we just put our heads together um, and we came up with uh, this idea of a digital curriculum. How about you, Dr. Majesco? Why did you guys need a video curriculum for the ICU? Well, the Grady ICU is actually a really special ICU and our residents have a lot of days off and a lot of time where unfortunately they're unable to attend lectures. Um, average residents are unable to attend about four to five lectures in a month and they tended to miss a lot of important ICU content. So um, we decided to utilize the Society of Critical Care Medicine's online curriculum to help supplement our already existing live curriculum. As you roll out this curriculum, how do you plan to measure the effect? So we've just started this July and we actually have one of our uh, fellows who is a former chief resident who is working on a research project to help uh, roll this out. We uh, just introduced the new interns to this program and several of them have already signed up. It's currently only the beginning of July, but we've got a few folks already using it. And uh, the goal is that we're going to assign them 10 lectures to review at their own time during the month. Uh, we're going to check in about mid-month and at the end of the month to check their progress. And um, because this is a research project, they actually took a pretest to test their baseline knowledge of medical ICU. And at the end of the month, they'll take a post-test on content and uh, their opinion about using this new curriculum. So, Giersch, how did you launch your curriculum? Okay, so in February 2015, we launched the video curriculum for our new class uh, for that academic year. And so it, the video curriculum consisted of about a dozen video tutorials on EKG interpretation. Uh, and then the students uh, worked on the video tutorials using learning modules. Uh, at the time we used a platform called Zaption, now we use a different one. Um, but there's a number of platforms out there that allow you to add questions onto a, a video that's publicly accessible. Um, and as a result of this video curriculum, we were able to make our class time a little bit shorter um, and we didn't have to add another class. Okay, And we were able to still kind of spend our class time focusing on practice. Now I know you're being modest but your videos have gotten almost 180,000 views on YouTube. Is there any other way in which you've measured the success of those videos? The, uh, <clears throat> the results have been great. Uh, we, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from the students uh, and we uh, put together a little uh, study where we compared students' ability to read an unknown EKG before the video curriculum and after the video curriculum. And we did show that kind of with the new curriculum, despite having less class time, uh, students uh, performed better on their ability to read an unknown EKG. What was your favorite video? Oh, that's tough. Uh, my favorite video would have to be the video on chamber abnormalities. So learning EKGs, you have to learn a, a ton of diagnostic criteria. You know, what's a pathologic Q wave? How do you diagnose LVH? Um, that sort of stuff. And so the, the video on chamber abnormalities is nice because it kind of shows graphically kind of the rationale for some of these criteria. So it seems less... Uh, so it seems less arbitrary. So. Now let's talk about RBH. With right ventricular hypertrophy, you'll notice that the forces of ventricular depolarization become more prominent in the vicinity of the right ventricle. And so as a consequence, you'll notice that in lead V1, the QRS complex will look more positive. Thus, one easy diagnostic criterion for RBH is to simply look in lead V1 
and look to see if the height of the R wave is taller than the depth of the S wave. In other words, look to see if the QRS complex looks positive. Now I should also say that in addition to having this, you should have a QRS axis that's either vertical or rightward. So let's look at the left atrium. Remember that it's located more posteriorly in the heart. So with left atrial enlargement, the forces of atrial depolarization will become oriented more posteriorly. Thus, if you were to put a precordial lead on a patient's back, you might notice that the P wave looks more positive. Now we don't put leads on the back, but looking at these six precordial leads, which one do you think would help you the most at identifying left atrial enlargement? What are your hopes for this new curriculum? My understanding is that the, uh, the pediatric residency program and general surgery programs also use online content to supplement their learning. So this seems to be a new trend across residencies and fellowships. And um, we're mostly interested to see if it's something that people think is beneficial and basically you know, see if this helps our residents learn the content better. Now we've seen two of our outstanding faculty members in different phases of implementing video curricula. Both are hoping to use this to improve quality of in-person teaching with faculty. If you're interested in making a video, be sure to look at our previous video on how to make a teaching video. It can be easier than you think. Happy teaching!